guys, um, welcome to my latest video. I'm gonna warn you now, if you haven't done the problems that I gave you a couple videos ago, um, if you haven't actually tried to work through these and solve them on your own, a lot of what we do today might not make a lot of sense. You really should do those problems. I'm going to give you a couple of more problems today. The ones I give you today are gonna be weirder and a little bit harder. Um, I want to start out today by correcting some of the typos from the slides um, from the slides last time. So if you look at the screen right now, what you see are a bunch of corrections to class five slides. Um, feel free to pause the video, make note of these, you know, make sure you understand what the class five slides were supposed to say. I'll of course be emailing these to you, but but you should make sure you understand the corrections. All right, now, the first thing that we're gonna do before I give you some weird problems is I wanna go over a few more of the proofs that I gave you the first time I gave you homework problems. And I wanna start out by proving this rule here. I wanna prove that when you negate the biconditional P biconditional Q, you end up saying P if and only if not Q, or not P if and only if Q. All right, those are all logically equivalent. That's what I want to start out proving. Um, now here's how you do this. You use the negation of P if and only if Q to prove P if and only if not Q. And then you prove P, you use P if and only if not Q as a premise to prove not P if and only if Q. And then you use not p if and only if q as a premise to prove the negation of p if and only if q. All right? And if you think about this for a minute, you'll see why, why this is all you have to do, right? If the first of these statements entails the second, and the second entails the third, and the third entails the first, then they all entail each other, right? Because to show, for example, that the second one entails the first one, all you have to do is combine the proof that the second one entails the third one with the proof that the third one entails the first one, right? It, it's, you've already done the proof, okay? So I'm going to start with the hardest one of these and then I'm going to get progressively easier. All right, so here is the hard one. And you can see this is quite a long proof, all right? My premise is the negation of P if and only if Q. And what I'm trying to prove is P if and only if not Q. All right, now P if and only if not Q is a biconditional. And so to prove it, I need to prove two conditionals. First, I need to prove if P then not Q, and then I need to prove if not Q then P. And those two statements are both conditionals. To prove them, I need to use my arrow introduction rule. And the first step of using my arrow introduction rule is just to assume that P. All right, so line two, I suppose that P. And the conditional I want to prove now is if P, then not Q. So now I need to find a way to prove not Q, all right? And I don't see an obvious way to do that, so I'm just going to suppose Q and try to use my not introduction rule. So on line three, I suppose Q. And now I need to find a contradiction. All right, and <laughs> the, only, the only easy way for me to find a contradiction is to find a statement that contradicts premise one, right? And so I need to find a way to prove P by conditional Q. All right, something like that. Um, and to do that, I need to prove if P then Q, and then I need to prove if Q then P. So on line four, I'm gonna start a new arrow introduction proof. On line four, I'm going to suppose that P, and now I'm trying to prove that Q, and there's no super easy way for me to do that. So I'm gonna assume that not Q, um, and, and then you can see um, 
the supposition on line 5 contradicts the supposition on line 3. So on line 6, I finally get Q and not Q. That's my AND introduction rule. And then that's a contradiction, so it proves the assumption on line 5 is false. So on line 7, I get not not Q from lines 5 through 6 by not introduction. And then on line, line 8, I get Q from my not elimination rule. Okay, so on line 4, I supposed that P, and on line 8, I proved that Q. So on line 9, I get P arrow Q. All right, so I'm halfway to getting a contradiction. Now I need to prove if Q then P. So I suppose that Q, and I need to prove P. There's no obvious way to do that, so I'm going to suppose that not P. And now you can see that line 11 contradicts line 2. So on 12, I get P and not P. That's a contradiction. So on line 13, I conclude that the supposition on line 11 was false. I get not not P from lines 11 through 12 by my not introduction rule. And then I use my not elimination rule to get rid of the nots. So on line 14, it just says P. So on line 10, I assumed, I supposed that Q. On line 14, I've proven that P. So on line 15, I get Q arrow P. That comes from 10 through 14 by my arrow introduction rule. And now if you look at line 9 and you look at line 15, you get P if and only if Q by my biconditional introduction rule. And line 16 contradicts line 1. Okay, so on line 17, I write down the contradiction. That proves that the supposition I made on line 3 is false. So on line 18, I get not Q. And that's, that's what I was trying to prove, right? I, I wanted to prove P arrow not Q. I've, I've just, I've gotten not Q. So on line 19, I get P arrow not Q. That comes from line 2 through line 18 by arrow introduction. All right. Now, in order to get the biconditional that I'm trying to prove, the next thing I need to get is not Q arrow P. And this proof is going to be exactly like what I just did, okay? In order to get not Q arrow P, I have to suppose that not Q, and then using that supposition, I have to prove that P. So on line 20, I suppose not Q. And I don't see any easy way to prove that P, so I'm going to suppose not P and look for a contradiction. How am I going to get a contradiction? Well... You know, the only, <laughs> the only things that I've, I've proven without any suppositions are line 1 and line 19, right? So probably I'm going to try to get a contradiction just like I did before. I'm going to try to prove P by conditional Q here. Okay, so to prove that, I have to prove P arrow Q and then prove P arrow, or, and then prove Q arrow P. So on line 22, I'm going to suppose that P, and I'm going to try to prove that Q. I don't see an obvious way to do that, so I'm going to suppose that not Q, and I'm going to try to find a contradiction. And you can see that line 21 contradicts 22. So on line 24, I write down the contradiction using my AND introduction rule. That contradiction proves that the supposition on line 23 was false. So on 25, I get not not Q by using my not introduction rule. And then on 26, I just get Q by using my not elimination rule. So on 22, I supposed that P. On 26, I proved that Q. So I have if P then Q on line 27 from my arrow introduction rule. Okay, so I have P arrow Q. Now, if I had Q arrow P, I would have something that contradicted line 1. So I'm going to suppose that Q and try to prove that P. So on line 28, I suppose that Q. In order to prove that P, I'm going to suppose that not P. Um, and I'm going to try to get a contradiction. And you can see now that line 28 contradicts line 21. So on line 30, I write down Q and not Q using my AND introduction rule. That's a contradiction. So the supposition I made on line 29 must be false. So on line 31, I get not, not P. And then on 32, I just get P using my not elimination rule. On 28, I supposed Q. On 32, I proved P. So on 33, I get Q arrow P. That's from lines 28 to 32 using my arrow introduction rule.
And now if you look at line 33 and you look at line 27, those two lines give me P if and only if Q, using my biconditional introduction rule. And line 34 contradicts line 1. So on line 35, I used the and introduction rule to write down the contradiction. That contradiction shows that the supposition I made all the way back on line 21 is false. So I get not not p. And then on line 37, that's p using my not elimination rule. So you can see now on line 20, I supposed not q. On line 37, I proved that p. So on 38, I get not q arrow p. And when I combine line 19 with line 38, that gives me p if and only if not q, which is the final thing that I was trying to prove. All right, so that's, that's the hard part of this problem, all right? You can see this proof is quite a bit more complicated um, than any of the proofs that we've done previously. There were 39 lines. A lot of the lines are not obvious. You know, I mean, I, I had to start out by making four suppositions in a row. I had to make a lot of other suppositions along the way. This, this is a pretty complicated proof, but that's how it works, okay? The next two proofs I have to do for this problem are considerably easier, okay? So now you're going to look at the proof um, I'm going to use p if and only if not q as a premise, and I'm going to use that to prove not p if and only if q. All right, so my premise is p if and only if not q, and I'm just going to use my biconditional elimination rule. Um, so line 2 says if p, then not q, and line 3 says if not q, then p. All right, and, you know, now in order to prove not p if and only if q, I have to prove two different conditionals. I have to prove if not p then q, and I have to prove if q then not p. All right, so we're going to start out proving if not p then q. In order to do that, we suppose not p on line 4. I'm trying to prove q, so I'm going to suppose not q. And now I'm going to try to find a contradiction. Well, if I combine line 5 with line 3, then using my arrow elimination rule, I get P on line 6. And line 6 contradicts line 4, so I use my AND introduction rule um, in order to write down a contradiction. On line 7, that contradiction proves that the supposition I made on line 5 was false. And so using my not introduction rule, I get not not q on line 8. Then I eliminate the nots from 8, using my not elimination rule to get q on 9. On 4, I supposed not p. On 9, I proved q. So on 10, I get if not p, then q, using my arrow introduction rule. Okay, and now I just need to prove if q, then not p. So on line 11, I'm going to suppose that q. I'm trying to prove not p, so I'm going to suppose that p. Um, and now you can see that by combining line 12 with line 2, I get not q from my arrow elimination rule. And then I just use my and introduction rule with lines 11 and 13 to get a contradiction. And that contradiction proves that the supposition on line 12 was false. So on line 15, I get not p using my not introduction rule. On 11, I supposed q. On 15, I proved not p. So on line 16, I get if q, then not p, using my arrow introduction rule. And now line 10 combined with line 16 gives me the biconditional I was trying to prove. It gives me not p if and only if q. Okay? There's a third proof we had to do for this problem. Um, this is the easiest of all, so I saved it for last. Here it is. The premise is not p if and only if q, and we're trying to prove the negation of p if and only if q. Okay, so the, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use our biconditional elimination rule. 
on line one. So we're going to end up with not p arrow q, and we're going to end up with q arrow not p. Those are lines two and three. And now since the thing we're trying to prove is a negation, we're just going to suppose the opposite of the negation we want to prove. On line four, we're going to suppose p if and only if q. Okay. On line five, that gives me p arrow q, and on line six, that gives me q arrow p, both from our biconditional elimination rules. And now we just need to find a contradiction somehow. I don't know how we're going to do it. So we just suppose that p on line 7. All right, And now you can see that if you combine with line, line 7 with line 5, we get q using arrow elimination. And if we combine line 8 with line 3, we get not p using arrow elimination. And on line 10, that gives us a contradiction, right? Line 9 contradicts line 7. So we have a contradiction, and that contradiction proves that the supposition on line 7 is false. So on line 11 we get not p. Now when you combine not p with line 2, that gives you q by the arrow elimination rule, and now line 12 combined with line, uh, line 12 combined with line 6 gives you p. Okay, again, using the arrow elimination rule. And now you can just see line 13 and line 11 contradict each other. So on line 14, we write down the contradiction using the and introduction rule. And that contradiction proves that the supposition we made back on line 4 is false. So on line 15, we get it is not the case that p if and only if q. All right. So that's how you do that one. You know, that, that was a long proof. That's way longer than anything we've done so far. You know, it, it was actually three different proofs. The first one was 39 lines. The second one was 17 lines. The third one was 15 lines. So it was, you know, 71 total lines of proof that we had to do to get that. All right, but that's, that's how you do it. Okay, so I wanted to, to give you an example of how to do one of the harder problems in case you guys were having trouble. None of you have emailed me or asked any questions. None of you have, you know, asked anything on the YouTube channel. Um, I'm not sure if this is because you don't have any questions or if it's just because you're not doing the problems. Um, but either way, I wanted to show you how to do that one because that one was a little bit tricky. Now, I'm going to give you three more tricky problems. All right, so one of the proofs that I did for you last time, I proved that we could replace our or elimination rule with a different rule. And I want to give you three more problems that are related to this idea. All right, so here they are if you look at the screen. First, prove that we could replace the not introduction rule with the following two rules, and then I've written down two rules. The first one says that the empty set proves p or not p, and the second one is this rule that I already showed you we could use to replace the, the or elimination rule. Okay, here's the second one. Prove that we can replace not elimination, not introduction, and or elimination all with just the following two rules. And the second rule is the same. It's just this rule we used before that we could use to replace or elimination. And the first rule, you see, is a lot like our not introduction rule. We've just switched the position of p and not p. All right, so it says that if gamma plus not p proves a contradiction, then gamma proves p. And here's the third problem. For the third problem, I want you to give an example of a valid argument that we can prove right now using our inference rules, but that we would not be able to prove if we replaced our not introduction rule and our or elimination rule with the following two rules. And the second one again is exactly the same. It's the rule that we already showed can replace or elimination. And the other one is just this rule that says the empty set proves p or not p. All right, now I'm, I'm going to do the first one of these for you right now. 
just to remind you how we do this, okay? The, the basic strategy here is that we start out using the rules we have, our ordinary inference rules, to just prove that, you know, the two inference rules on the screen there are in fact valid arguments. And then what we do is we pretend that we didn't have the not introduction rule at all, and we use those two new inference rules to prove that the not introduction rule is a valid argument. All right, now, I, I've already proven that the second of these things is a valid argument for you, so I'm not going to do that again. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to prove that the first one is valid, and then I'm going to use those two rules to prove that not introduction is valid. Okay, so here's, here's how it goes. The thing that we're trying to prove here is that the empty set entails p or not p. And that means we have to do a proof that has no premises at all. And to do a proof that has no premises at all, we have to start out with a supposition. Otherwise, we just don't have anything to write down. Okay, so on line one, I'm going to make a supposition. I'm going to suppose that the thing we're trying to prove is false. Okay, so I suppose it is not the case that p or not p. And now I have to find a contradiction. Okay, this should be familiar. You should already know how to do this because we've done a problem just like it before. So on line two, we suppose that p. On line three, that gives us p or not p using our or introduction rule. And line three contradicts line one. So on line four, we use the and introduction rule to write down a contradiction. The contradiction proves that the supposition on line two is false. So on line five, we get not p. And that gives us p or not p using our or introduction rule. And line six now contradicts line one. So on line seven, we use our and introduction rule to write down the contradiction. That proves that the supposition on line one was false. So we get not not p or not p from lines one through seven using our not introduction rule. And then for line nine, we just use our not elimination rule and we get our conclusion, p or not p. All right, so we've, we've proven that. This, this is a good argument. We can prove it using our ordinary inference rules. And now what we need to do is we need to use these two rules, the one that I just proved and the one that I proved last time, in order to show the, the not introduction rule is a valid argument. Here's how we do this, all right? Remember what the not introduction rule says. It says that whenever gamma plus p proves q and not q, gamma proves not p. Okay, so we're just going to assume for this whole proof that gamma plus p proves q and not q. Okay, and then our premise is gamma, and we're going to use gamma to prove not p. But we're not going to use our not introduction rule. Okay, so line one says gamma. Gamma is just our premises. Okay, line two says p or not p. That's the first of these new rules. Okay, remember the first of these new rules is the empty set proves p or not p. So there we have p or not p on line two. And now I have to use the second of these new rules in order to prove not p. And you can see the, the rule that we have to use on line 12, right? In the parentheses on the right-hand side, I've written down the rule, right? What it says is that when you have a disjunction and then you have two conditionals, okay, and the consequent of both conditionals is the thing you want to prove, and the antecedent of both conditionals are the two disjunctions, or the two disjuncts from the disjunction, then you, you can prove the conclusion you want. Okay, so I'm trying to prove not p. What I need to do is get two conditionals. I need one conditional that says p arrow not p, and I need another conditional that says not p arrow not p, and then combined with the disjunction on line two, that would allow me to prove not p. Okay, so to prove the first conditional, I'm going to start out supposing that p, and then I'm going to try to prove not p. Okay, so on line three, I suppose p. Now remember, Gamma plus p proves q and not q. So on line four, I get q and not q. Okay. So on line five, I get q. On line six, I get not q. Those both come from line four using my and elimination rule. 
And now, you know, I can use my, my or introduction rule to write down Q or not P on line 7. But now line 7 combined with line 6 proves not P using my or elimination rule. Okay, so I assumed that, I supposed that P on line 3, I proved not P on line 8, so on line 9 I get P arrow not P using my arrow introduction rule. Now I just need to prove not P arrow not P. And I've shown you how to do this before. On line 10, I suppose not P. What am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for not P. There it is. It's on line 10, where I just supposed it, right? So on line 11, I just get not P arrow not P from line 10 using my arrow introduction rule. Right, so now on, on line 2, I have a disjunction, P or not P. On line 9, I have P arrow not P. On line 11, I have not P arrow not P. And that's, that's all I need using this second made-up rule in order to prove that not P. Okay, so if I use my ordinary inference rules, um, I can prove these two new inference rules work. And using these two new inference rules, um, I can prove that my not introduction rule works. Okay, so I, I could replace not introduction with these two rules if I really wanted to. Okay, so I want you to do, you know, the second and third of these tricky problems. Here they are again on the screen. Um, you know, again, you know, let me know if you have any problems doing this. Or just if you have any questions. Now, I, I hope that you do have questions about these problems. These, these problems are really, really weird, which is why I'm giving them to you. I want you to think very, very carefully about what I'm asking you to prove. Okay. So first, we've already proven that this inference rule that says P arrow R, Q arrow R, P or Q proves R, can be used to replace our or elimination rule. And here's what I just proved, that if we combine that rule with the empty set proves P or not P, that that's all we need uh, to replace the not introduction rule. Okay, so we, we know those two facts. And now here's what I just asked you to do. I hope you were able to do it. I asked you to find an example of an argument that shows those two rules together cannot be used to replace both or elimination and not introduction. Now think about how weird that is. I just proved that you can use them both to, to, to replace not introduction. And I already proved that the first one by itself can be used to replace or elimination. But if you try to replace both or elimination and not introduction with both of them, it doesn't work. And here's what's even weirder. Okay, here's, here's what's even weirder about this. Look at the second of the tricky problems I gave you again. Our not introduction rule can be replaced by the rule that says if gamma plus not p proves q and not q, then gamma proves p. Okay, prove that. You, you should prove that. You can do this. This is an easy problem. It can also be replaced by the combination of problems that, or by the combination of inference rules that I've, I've given you in the third tricky problem. Okay, and you just proved um, that the rule that says P arrow R, Q arrow R, P or Q proves R combined with the rule that says if gamma plus P proves Q and not Q, then gamma proves P can replace or elimination and not introduction and not elimination all at the same time. Okay, now just think about how weird that is for a minute. Okay, if if you're not confused by this, 
you're probably not thinking about it carefully enough. You, you probably don't understand it if you don't see why this is confusing. All right. There's an important lesson here, which is that it's really, really hard to know whether a set of inference rules is right. It's, it's hard to know whether a set of inference rules is able to prove all of the things that we need it to be able to prove. And so here's the question that I want you to think about as you're solving these problems. How might we be able to prove that the inference rules that I've given you are the right inference rules? How could we prove that? All right, think about that. On the screen now, um, this is just a bunch of new vocabulary. There are very common names that a lot of logicians and philosophers use for arguments and inference rules that are extremely common. All right, so for example, our arrow elimination rule is usually called modus ponens. Our arrow introduction rule is usually called conditional proof. Okay, what I have written down here are just a bunch of different names for arguments and inference rules that I've already shown you. All right, so these are good things to know. If you know these terms, you know, it'll be a lot easier for you to understand um, the way that philosophers and logicians talk when they talk about these different types of arguments. Okay, that's all I wanted to cover for today. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Let me know if you're having any trouble with the problems I've given you. And otherwise, I will see you in my next video.